Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? That moment that you're going to remember forever for the rest of your life? Uh, for scouts, it might be that moment after months, even years of preparation, you have, you have the ability to earn your Eagle Scout. Who's headed in that direction? Are you all going for Eagle Scout? I imagine if you're here, that's something you want to do. Uh, some have already earned that. That's a mountaintop experience because it, it marks a, a momentous time in your scouting life. For the parents who are here, I know from me, um, there was a mountaintop experience when I held that newborn baby for the first time, amen? Uh, something I'm going to experience soon, holding that grandchild. I think that's probably even more special from what I hear. Looking very much forward to that. It's a moment you want to savor forever. Theologian Ed Robb describes these mountaintop moments this way. Mountaintop moments are when we experience the power, love, and grace of God in a way difficult to capture with words. That's the kind of mountaintop moment we'll read about in our scripture this morning. I've had more than one mountaintop moment, and I pray you have as well, but one of them came when my son was only 18 months old, and uh, he was like a limp noodle in my arm, and we took him to the hospital, didn't know what, did, to the doctor, and didn't know what was going on. Immediately, they sent us to the hospital. You know it's not good news when, when they do that, and they did a, a spinal tap and found out he had spinal meningitis. He was immediately hospitalized, and I, I remember this moment as if it was yesterday, but I just laid over my son in that hospital bed, and I prayed for all I was worth for his healing, for my healing, for our family's healing as we went through that dark moment in time. Fortunate for us, our, our prayers were answered in the way we had hoped. But even if they had not been, in that moment, there was a peace that came over me that only comes from God. When we really don't know what the future holds and yet we are forced to trust, Trust that God will never leave us or forsake us. And that is what I felt in that moment when I surrendered to Christ. It was a mountaintop moment. Those mountaintop moments give us a sense of God's presence in our lives. Those moments change the way we perceive God and, and who we are as well. This morning I want to read about a mountaintop moment in Scripture from Matthew's Gospel. But before I do that, let us pray again. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. Amen. Hear now the word of God from Matthew 17. I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, and they were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can 
you even imagine what it was like on that mountain? The disciples, they wanted to pitch their tents. Do we love pitching our tents? They wanted to pitch their tents and stay there. Right now, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began in Wilmore, Kentucky, at Asbury University. It's right across the street from Asbury Theological Seminary where I received my Master's of Divinity, and it has spread to that campus, and it's spreading to other campuses. People are coming from around the world to, to experience what can only be described as a mountaintop experience, the very presence of the living Word of God. I pray for that outpouring of the Holy Spirit to spread across the world. That's what happened on Mount Tabor all those years ago. Moses and Elijah, two great prophets of the faith, long dead, appear on the mountain with Jesus as Jesus is transfigured, taking on what looks like an angelic appearance. I love how Peter, James, and John reacted. They wanted to pitch tents for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. They wanted to remain on the mountaintop forever. They never wanted to come down. They wanted to hold on to that glorious moment. But Jesus reminds them by coming down the mountain that there is work still to do in the valley. Now keep in mind just prior to what I read for you this morning in chapter 16, Jesus has told the disciples, here's what he says in 1621, from that time on Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. But Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You're setting your heart not on divine things, but on human things. How many of us do that? We put our own needs ahead of the needs of Christ. That's a sermon for another day. That's why I have a manuscript, so I don't go down every rabbit trail I uh, uncover. But then Jesus tells the disciples, he says, continuing on here in verse 24 of chapter 16, he says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? So what does it mean to take up the cross of Christ? It means to live a transfigured life. It means putting Christ first in everything we do. It means loving God and loving people. It means making disciples of Christ. And we can only do this not by our power, but by the power of the one who lives within us. And we receive that power when we spend time on the mountain with Jesus. Mountaintop moments are when we experience the power, love, and grace of God in a way difficult to capture with words. Those moments that give us a sense of God's presence in our lives. Those moments that change our perspective of who God is and who we are. I've been to the very mountain where Jesus was transfigured, Mount Tabor. And while that moment was incredible, it's in the everyday moments of my ordinary life that I experience Jesus most. Moments that change my perspective of who God is and who I am in Christ. It's that moment I described of my son in the hospital room all those years ago that remains with me. 
It's those moments when a child, not quite two years old, in this very Sunday school class down here, passes out hymnals to the adults. And those who are in that 9 a.m. Sunday school class know what I'm talking about. It's a beautiful moment. I see a child being raised to know what it is to love and serve God in real and tangible ways. A child being raised to live a transfigured life. I saw it yesterday. I experienced Christ's presence when we were at Donovan's Dream with the confirmation class. And do you know what the kids said? Can we do this again? I'm like, yeah, sure. We can serve. That's living a transfigured life. Living a transfigured life. It's those moments when a 40-year-old man devotes his life to teaching not only his own son, but to so many others, to do their best, to do their duty to God and their country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep themselves physically strong, mentally awake and morally straight. It's those moments when a few dozen volunteers walk into a prison to spend four days in a spiritual life retreat with incarcerated women, women, teaching them how to develop a Christian community even though they live behind bars. These women have hit a low point in their lives. Some of them have even spent their whole lives blaming other people for their problems. Do we all know somebody that does that? It's not my fault. I wouldn't have done this had it not been for that. And through Jesus' love, mercy, and grace as lived out through these Kairos prison ministry volunteers, they learn, <clears throat> like we learn, that our life is the result of our choices. The choices we make matter. When volunteers return from monthly reunions, we see the Holy Spirit at work. Those are mountaintop moments for me. To be there and to see what God is doing in those prisons. We see women living a transfigured life. Even when horrible things happen to us, things we don't choose. Like a difficult diagnosis the death of a spouse. We have a choice on how we respond. We can blame others. We can even blame God. Or we can ask, how will God redeem this awful experience? In my own life, I find myself in a place where I am asking God, why? Why did such a good man die so young? Well, I may never get the answer to that question on this side of heaven. By trusting God to bring about his purposes through this suffering, I know that not only will I survive, I will grow stronger, richer in my faith. Through this time in the fire, I'm being forged, I'm being transfigured. I've already seen so much good come out of my own pain. And as I am willing to talk about what I'm going through and the articles I write about losing my husband that have been published in the newspaper, I sense God's presence moving me to do this, to share. And I see the truth of Romans 8.28, which says how all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I've also been to the mountaintop. I've experienced the power, love, and grace of God in a way difficult to capture with words. And had I never experienced the searing pain that I've experienced in my life, I may never have experienced God's amazing grace, power, and love in the same way. 
I've experienced those moments that give us a sense of God's presence in our lives. Those moments that change our perspective of who God is and who we are in Christ. So church, are we living a transfigured life? Are we living a transfigured life? Are we willing to do what Jesus asked his own disciples to do? Are we denying ourselves to take up the cross of Christ? What does that mean, taking up the cross of Christ? What does it mean to live a transfigured life? Living a transfigured life means putting Christ first in everything. Loving God and people. Making disciples of Christ. We can only live this transfigured life when we're willing to spend time on the mountain with Jesus. Time in conversation, time in prayer. That revival that began in Wilmore began when about a dozen people stayed after church and prayed. Something happened. Living a transfigured life means putting Christ first in everything, loving God and people, making disciples of Christ. My prayer is that each of us has those mountaintop moments with Jesus. Moments when we experience the amazing grace love and power of Christ, moments that give us a sense of God's presence in our lives. And that we would allow those moments to change how we see God, how we see ourselves. When we're willing to take up the cross of Christ, we are transfigured. We are changed. We trust that God loves us and wants the very best for us no matter what we experience on this earth. Whether we are walking through a valley or coming down off of a mountaintop, God is always with us. And sometimes we want to pitch our tents. Now, sometimes we want to pitch our tents in the valley and have a little pity party, amen? Amen. Sometimes we want to pitch our tents on the mountain and say, it's so wonderful here. I want to stay here forever, but wherever we are. Let us remember God's instructions. He came down off that mountain because there is work to do in the valley. You remember the last line of the scripture I read this morning. It says, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Well, friends, the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. We don't have to keep silent anymore. We can share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time to tell everyone what God is doing in our lives, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us. How he longs for the very best of us. It's time to go and tell the world about who Christ is. 